Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today, I want to start looking at one of the most fundamental questions we can ask in chemistry. How can we tell whether a particular chemical reaction is possible? We actually haven't addressed that question yet. In the first part of the course, we looked at the kinetics of chemical reactions, which allowed us to find out the rates of reactions and how the rate is affected by conditions like the temperature and concentration. But it didn't tell us whether the reaction is possible in the first place. Then, in the past several videos, we've looked at the relationships between four thermodynamic properties of chemical processes. The heat, work, energy, and enthalpy. These properties do a thorough job of describing how energy is transformed from one form to another during a chemical reaction, but even this isn't enough to tell us whether the reaction is possible. At first, this might seem surprising. You know from experience that a system is more stable when it has a lower energy, so it might seem like a reaction must simply have a negative enthalpy in order to be possible. As you might remember, when delta H is negative, the reaction is exothermic, and you're probably familiar with lots of exothermic reactions. For example, here is the reaction between aluminum and iodine to form aluminum iodide. As you can tell, it's a highly exothermic reaction. The reaction has an enthalpy of negative 302.92 kilojoules per mole. As you might guess, the fact that the enthalpy decreases so much is a major reason why this reaction is possible. However, there are also many reactions in which the enthalpy increases. Endothermic reactions like these aren't as familiar to most people, but you've almost certainly seen them before. For example, if you've ever injured yourself while playing a sport, you might have used a cold pack to help prevent the injured site from swelling. Some cold packs are actually stored at room temperature. The reason they get cold is that when the pack is squeezed, it breaks an inner container that releases one of the reactants of the chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is this one, in which solid ammonium nitrate dissolves to form aqueous ammonium ions and nitrate ions. This chemical reaction has an enthalpy of positive 25.7 kilojoules per mole, so it's endothermic. However, the reaction does occur spontaneously, even though the enthalpy increases. That shows us that the enthalpy change alone isn't enough to tell us whether or not a reaction is possible. What else do we need to know in order to predict whether a reaction can happen? The initial factor we need to know about is another thermodynamic property, but one we haven't discussed yet, the entropy. You probably learned about entropy back in your general chemistry course when you saw that entropy is a measure of the degree of randomness a system has. The more disordered a system is, the higher its entropy. However, that's a rather vague definition. How do we quantify the amount of disorder in a system? Today, and in the next couple of videos, we'll delve deeper into the definition of entropy and come up with a more exact definition for it. It turns out that every spontaneous process, such as a chemical reaction, always results in an increase in entropy for a closed system. That's a very important principle, so important that it gets its own name, the second law of thermodynamics. But let's reword this so that we use a more exact definition of the entropy. Another way of stating the second law of thermodynamics is that when a spontaneous process occurs, the spread of the distribution of energies the molecules have always increases. You might remember that the distribution of energies is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and we spent a lot of time discussing the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and finding out how it works back in videos 11 and 12. So the second law is telling us that the width of this distribution must increase during a spontaneous process so that the molecules in the system are more likely to have a wider range of different energies. There are a few different things to notice about this idea. First, in order for it to be true, we must have a large number of molecules. If we only had one molecule, it wouldn't make sense to talk about a distribution of energies, because a single molecule can only have one energy at a given time. Next, notice that the complete set of possible states that a system could have is enormous. We call that set of states an ensemble. When we measure a property, for example the temperature, we're actually measuring the average of that property for the whole ensemble. 
Each individual molecule will have its own different value for that property, and those values often follow the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. As I mentioned, the number of possible states a system could have is huge. Each of the possible states is called a microstate, and the total number of microstates a system has is given by the symbol capital omega. So, now that we know that, we can restate the second law of thermodynamics in a more precise way. The second law says that a spontaneous process always results in an increase in the value of omega. So, the entropy is connected to omega, the number of microstates available to our system. Let's see how we can quantify that. Suppose you have a system that contains n distinguishable particles, and each particle can be in one of r different microstates. We could distribute the particles among the different states in many different ways according to this equation. This symbol may be unfamiliar to you. It's called n factorial, and it means that we multiply the integer n by every positive integer that's smaller than it is. So, for example, 9 factorial is equal to 9 times 8 times 7, and so on, all the way down to 1. When we perform that calculation, we find that 9 factorial is equal to 362,880. So, our equation has n factorial in the numerator, and the product of the factorials of the population for each of the different microstates in the denominator. We can make this equation a little shorter by using this notation. Here, the capital pi is the symbol we use for the product of a series of different quantities. Just as we use the symbol sigma to indicate a sum of quantities, pi is used to indicate a product. Let's try using this equation. Suppose we have a system consisting of five particles, each of which could be in one of three different states. One particle is in state A, and two particles are in each of states B and C. In how many different ways could we arrange the system so that this is possible? We'll use this equation. There are five particles, so n is 5. In the denominator, we have the factorials of the number of particles in each of the states. When we perform the calculation, we get w equals 30. So there are 30 different ways we could set up the system. Now let's try that again. But this time, suppose that all five particles are in the same state, state B. In that case, here's what we'd have for our calculation. There are no particles in states A or C, so both of those contribute zero factorial to the denominator. It turns out that, by definition, zero factorial is equal to 1. So, this fraction is just equal to 5 factorial over 5 factorial, which is equal to 1. Now let's think about the answers we got for our two problems. The second example is clearly very ordered. All the particles are in the same energy state, and we got a value of 1 for w. In the first example, there was a wider distribution of states, and our value of w was much larger. Since the entropy is connected to the range of the distribution of states, we can tell there's a connection between W and the entropy. As we'll see in the next video, the Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann defined the entropy this way. The entropy has the symbol S. We've seen the constant Kb before. It's called the Boltzmann constant, and you might recall that it's just equal to R, the gas law constant, divided by Avogadro's number. It might seem strange that we're using the logarithm of w in this definition instead of just plain w, but it actually makes a lot of sense. As we saw in our second problem, when all the particles in our system are in the same energy state, we get a value of 1 for w. The logarithm of 1 is 0, so this would give us a value of 0 for our entropy. That's exactly what we want. If all the particles are in the same state, that's a perfectly ordered system. There's no disorder at all in that case. Since entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system, it makes sense for the entropy to be zero in that situation. What else can we do with this? Well, suppose our system can be divided into two parts, which we'll call x and y. 
These two parts might be physically separated so that all the molecules in X are in one location and all the molecules in Y are in a different location, but that isn't necessary. For instance, suppose all the molecules in X are colored red and all the molecules in Y are blue. In this example, the two sets of molecules are mixed together, and that's okay for our purposes. The overall entropy is just equal to the entropy of the molecules in part X plus the entropy of the molecules in part Y. Using Boltzmann's definition of entropy, we can rewrite the equation this way. Let's simplify this a bit by factoring out KB. And finally, recall that the sum of two logarithms is just equal to the logarithm of the product of the two numbers, so we can rewrite our equation like this. Now that we've looked in some detail at the way particles can be distributed into different states, let's tie that back to our earlier discussion of microstates. We said earlier that the number of different microstates is called omega. So there are omega possible microstates and a total of n different particles. Suppose that each particle is equally likely to be in any of the omega different microstates. In that case, the entropy for each particle would be equal to kb times the logarithm of omega. To get the total entropy, we'd have to add together the entropy for each of the n different particles. So we'd have n times kb times the logarithm of omega. In this situation, where each particle has an equal probability of being in each of the omega different microstates, we call omega the degeneracy of the system. So now we have two different equations for the entropy. Let's try a few examples to see when each of these two equations is used. Just as before, suppose we have five particles, each of which can be in three different states. Earlier, we saw that when one particle is in state A and two particles are in each of states B and C, we got a value of 30 for W. Plugging that into our formula for the entropy, we find that the entropy of this system is 4.697 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Now let's try that again, but this time suppose that the five particles can be in any of the three possible states with equal probability. In that case, we can use the other equation we have for entropy. Each of the three microstates is equally probable, so the degeneracy of our system is 3. If we plug that into our equation, we get an entropy of 7.586 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Notice that this entropy is a little higher than the one that we got in the first case. That makes sense. If all the particles were in the same energy state, that would be a perfectly ordered system. As we saw a little earlier, that would make w equal to 1, and using this equation, we would have 0 for our entropy. Just as having all the particles in the same microstate gives us an entropy of 0, the more widely the particles are distributed among the different states, the larger the entropy will be. The widest distribution we can get is the one in which all the different microstates can be occupied with equal probability. And that's the situation we had in the second problem we did, in which, because the different states were all degenerate, all five particles could be in the three states with equal likelihood. For that reason, the entropy in that situation was the highest. So far, we've been working with extremely tiny systems, it's very unlikely that we'd ever have a system with just five molecules in it. Instead, we usually have systems that have something closer to a mole of particles. Let's try a calculation using those more realistic numbers. Suppose we have a mole of particles that can be in 10 different microstates with equal probability. What would be the entropy of this system? Since all 10 microstates are equally probable, that means the degeneracy is 10, and we can use this equation. We have a mole of molecules, so n, the total number, is equal to Avogadro's number. 
When we plug those numbers into the equation, we find that the entropy is 19.15 joules per Kelvin. Well, that's enough new material for now. Now that we've got a good understanding of the basic meaning of entropy, in the next video we'll start tying it to the thermodynamic properties that we looked at in the previous videos, like work and heat. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.